This week in Western Water News, cleanup efforts, funding fights, shrinking reservoirs, tribal water rights, and new drought updates. In the Colorado River Basin, the stories all point to one thing. Our water future is under pressure. But first, here are some responses to comments. One of our viewers, St. Peter 2034, points out that crops like corn and alfalfa don't make sense in the West because they can be grown where it rains. He suggests banning those crops in arid states and subsidizing production back east. It's true that alfalfa and other forage crops are among the thirstiest in the West. According to the University of California, alfalfa uses about four to six acre feet of water per acre every year. That means one acre of alfalfa can require up to two million gallons of water annually. But here's why it isn't as simple as shifting production east. Alfalfa is a perennial crop that provides multiple harvests a year in the West. That steady supply makes it the backbone of the dairy and beef industries. In wetter climates, the growing season is shorter and harvests are fewer, so yields per acre are lower. There's also the issue of trade. Much of the alfalfa grown in the West is exported overseas, especially to Asia. That might be changing because of tariffs, but nonetheless, researchers have documented how alfalfa exports account for billions of dollars in revenue, which makes a political ban very unlikely. That said, your point about subsidies is important. Economists from Utah State University and the USDA have both suggested that shifting incentives away from high water crops could free up millions of acre feet of water for cities and rivers. So while an outright ban may not happen, policies that encourage crop switching are on the table. And that's a debate worth watching. Save My Republic from Michigan says, We have five Great Lakes. We don't need five. I am okay if we give you one of them. Certainly Lake Superior should fill your needs. Build a pipeline. It's a tempting idea. Moving Great Lakes water west by pipeline has been studied for decades, and every study shows the same thing. It's technically possible, but economically and politically unworkable. First, the scale is massive. To move just one million acre feet of water, a fraction of what the Colorado River provides, you would need a pipeline longer than the Trans-Alaska oil pipeline, with enormous pumping stations to lift water over the Continental Divide. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has estimated that projects of this scale would cost tens to hundreds of billions of dollars and consume huge amounts of energy. Second, there are legal barriers. The Great Lakes Compact of 2008, signed by the eight U.S. states bordering the lakes and ratified by Congress, explicitly bans most diversions of Great Lakes water outside the basin. Finally, the lakes themselves aren't endless. The U.S. Geological Survey reports that Great Lakes levels fluctuate due to climate change, evaporation, and changing precipitation. In fact, both record lows in 2013 and record highs in 2019 and 2020 have stressed communities along the lakes. So while we appreciate the generous offer, the reality is that the Great Lakes are legally protected, economically out of reach, and environmentally vulnerable. For now, Western states have to work within the Colorado River system and local conservation. And now, on to the week's news. The U.S. Department of Energy has approved a pilot study to clean up contaminated groundwater at the Santa Susana Field Laboratory in California. Once home to rocket testing and nuclear research, the site has a long history of pollution. The new project will test biological and chemical methods to break down contaminants underground. Officials stress, this is just one step in a broader cleanup strategy that has already removed more than 67,000 gallons of polluted water. A new Congressional Research Service report warns that the Trump administration's proposed 2026 budget would sharply cut water project funding across the West. The Bureau of Reclamation alone would see funding drop by more than $600 million rural water projects, water recycling, desalination research, and wastewater upgrades all face steep reductions. For the Colorado River Basin states, where drought and growth already strain supplies, these cuts could mean slower progress and delayed projects. Researchers warn the Colorado River Basin is using more water than the river provides, and reservoirs can no longer cover the gap. As of September 1st, Lake Powell had just 7 million acre-feet of storage with only 2.7 million above the safe operating line. Lake Mead reported 8.1 million acre-feet, 
but only 3.6 million above its critical threshold. If use continues at current levels, accessible storage in both lakes could fall to 3.6 million acre-feet by next summer. The report stresses that physical limits, not legal rules, now dictate water availability. Without immediate conservation, federal agencies may have to impose drastic cuts before new post-2026 management rules take effect. This week saw two big developments for tribal water rights. First, the Navajo-Utah Water Rights Settlement Agreement is now legally enforceable. This ends decades of litigation and confirms the Navajo Nation's rights to surface and groundwater in Utah, backed by funding for new water projects. Second, the Environmental Protection Agency announced over $3 million for projects to reduce lead in tribal drinking water systems. Projects include replacing lead-lined mains in Oklahoma, restoring a tank for the Mescalero Apache tribe in New Mexico, and rehabbing tanks for the White Mountain Apache in Arizona. Welcome to Blast from the Basin, where history reminds us just how timeless our water challenges really are. From the October 9th, 1922 Boston Globe comes the story of F.G. Harmon, a student at MIT who claimed he'd cracked the code to perpetual motion. Professors, students, even the newspapers, were convinced he'd built a machine that could run forever. But the big breakthrough? A hoax. Harmon had simply hidden a water pump and siphon, sending the same water around in circles to fool everyone watching. The machine didn't create endless energy. It only created the illusion of it. Why does that matter today? Because Western water policy is often asked to do the same thing, pull off the impossible, make rivers supply more water than they hold, promise certainty in an age of drought and climate stress. For a while, the illusion can hold. But just like Harmon's machine, reality eventually catches up. Perpetual motion will always be a fantasy. But sustainable water management, that's where the real work and the real solutions must be found. And that's your blast from the basin. In New Mexico, Los Alamos National Laboratory has begun controlled venting of tritium gas from old waste containers. Officials say the work is tightly monitored and releases remain far below federal safety limits. But environmental groups have asked Governor Michelle Lugin Grisham to halt the operation, citing health risks. The debate continues as the work proceeds over the next two weeks. Also on Friday, Arizona State University announced an October 23rd lecture called Groundwater Earth, the Hidden Frontline of Climate Change. Researcher Anthony Axiavati will share two decades of work on how groundwater sustains billions of people, but faces severe overuse worldwide. The latest U.S. drought monitor shows worsening conditions in the Midwest, Northeast, and Southeast, while early autumn storms brought relief in parts of the Rockies and Northern California. In Arizona and New Mexico, late-season monsoon rains reduced areas of exceptional drought, offering some of the best improvements in weeks. Western Colorado and northwestern Wyoming also saw gains from steady rainfall. But Utah and Nevada remain stubbornly dry, and California still faces widespread drought despite scattered early-season storms. Looking ahead, forecasts call for warm weather nationwide, with a chance of above-normal rainfall along the West Coast. That's it for this week's Water News. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss next week's roundup and visit westernwater.com for more details on these stories plus daily updates Monday through Saturday. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week.